Yeah, I'm well. I was just saying many changes this year. It's been quite a roller coaster, that's for sure. Kind of changes. Whew. Seminal identity shifts on an ongoing basis. <laughs> uh, okay. Oh, that's life. You're a protopian yeah. now. Yeah. <laughs> well, look. I mean, uh, that's been that's been uh, that's been the way it's been for a while, to be honest. But the, uh, you know, feeling each step of the cycle. Mm-hmm. It's uh, that dynamic between libido and mortido having been steeped yeah. now in digital libido for the last few days, comfortable in using <laughs> uh, that, that dialectic. I mean, hey, these are, it's the real shit. Yeah, it's the, um, the, to Hegel, the fundamental dialectic is between subject and substance. And it's incredibly interesting now when I started to read Hegel through Andrews and my religious affiliations and origins. I mean, when you read Hegel through mm-hmm. Vajrayana Buddhism or you read him through Zoroastrianism, it gets really, really interesting. But, uh, but the point with doing a dialectic of libido or tiro is that it's for nature as a whole. You don't have to look at the fact that the human has arrived in the world, which Hegel says, we cannot think outside of that. He is absolutely right. Uh, and so subject versus substance in Hegel is that there can, be no, there can be no substance without subject because the whole idea that there is substance must come from some kind of subjectivity. And it's, you know, it is absolutely right on that. But when you think of libido and mortido, for example, you can walk into nature, you can, you can discuss animals and plants, you can see celestial existence out in the universe and things like that. And you, and you see it's, it's more cosmological in that sense that, yeah, th- there are forces out there and these forces sort of weaken with time and then they somehow rematerialize. Mm. So, mm. so we can look at ourselves that way. In, 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 mm. um, in, uh, I don't know if maybe I'm maybe talking too much because you want to do the recording eventually, right? Or put the recording button on or something. Well, the recording button is on. Um, <laughs> yeah, the recording button is on. I you mean, always have to already. press the recording button on with Alexander because you might miss something if you don't. <laughs> because yeah. he starts right away. Yeah, yeah. Okay. well, I mean, my, uh, my way of relating to podcasts, and the whole medium of having conversations like this at the moment is all of, like even just saying that that dynamic between when the recording buttons on and when it's off is very fascinating and i can use that as some sort of meta little incision into all of a sudden i think this uh, say confusion i say this um duration of transformation we're in we're trying to understand well what are the healthy dynamics of interaction in the digital sphere in this time between worlds right um uh you know we can we can pick up a lot of uh, alexander's language to sort of situate us in this and and i do have a sense of how we can sort of construct a experience for the listener that sort of grounds us in ultimately where i feel is, is deeply present of, uh, of where I'd like to go. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm happy to, happy to do that and sort of set the table. Um, but by the same token, I'm just sort of glad to be here with you guys really, and, um, have a chat about whatever. So. Uh, this is what I call membranics. Mm. Are we in or are we out? So is the recording button on or is it off? And what's interesting, it's like, mm. are we private or are we public? For mm-hmm. example. Okay. So membranics, what's great about membranics is that you can, you can talk about a simple life form, for example. As soon as you've got a little lipid, right, it starts to isolate itself. And as soon as you've got a difference in pressure or, for example, temperature, it becomes an outside and an inside of that membrane. Peter Sloterdijk has a wonderful word for the inside of the membrane. He calls it the sphere. But I don't want to focus too much on the sphere. I think actually the dynamic between the outside and the inside is much more interesting. So we call it membranics. But sphere is the proper term, philosophical term, for the inside of a membrane, okay? So this is like, think of the simplest life form. That's a, that's a good example. So as soon as you've got an inside and outside, you've got to get, you've got to have a communication with the outside world. That communication has to be slowed down. So you've got to discuss, do we have a low threshold or a high threshold for what we, three of us here, isolate when we go private compared to when we go public and you start recording and that can be published and anybody can share it. Because the outside here is clearly public and the inside is a private between three men. We're having a threesome with one another right here, right? So the membranics means that 
you, you got to understand that the communication with the outside world is a lot about how do I get nutrition inside so the subject, subject can thrive in the outside. Obviously, subjectivity starts on the inside and objectivity is it's on the outside. So the subject-object relationship is in between the two. So you've got a project here. The project is to make the subjectivity thrive within the membrane. So it's like, a, you let, kind of, like you're talking about a womb in a way, like if, if it's a no, sphere, what, no, it, no, it's no, no, no. And, oh, yeah. and it, it's a developmental mm -hmm, thing. Correct, but, but a womb is within a process where spheres are being created. So it's more about actually interspherical relationships when you talk about the womb. That's why it's such a hmm. strong uh, image for us as well, the strong archetype. But we can get back to that later. But this is just the principle of what membranics is. Membranics is essentially the study or the exercise of how you communicate to an outside and inside within a sphere. So you got to get nutrition in and you got to get the shit out <laughs> for yeah. the survival of the membrane itself. So membrane needs memory very early on. And that's exactly why we started looking at psyche and mind and things like that. You know, how far back can we go? And certainly in biology, you go all the way back into biology, possibly not in chemistry. I don't think molecules need any of that, but, but you need a memory very early on because you got to start, you got to start communicate with the outside world and you better not repeat mistakes. You better learn from previous experiences so your guesswork gets better over time. This is what we call wisdom, ironically. So uh -huh. wisdom yeah. is essentially just how you learn how to communicate with the outside world to protect the value, whatever is inside, to add more nutrition on the inside, possibly even expand the sphere, hopefully, but they get the shit out. And that shit hopefully then becomes nutrition in another sphere. This, for example, our plants and animals collaborate with one another so perfectly because what's shit to the animal becomes nutrition for the plant and what's shit for the plant becomes nutrition for the animal. That's what we have in nature, right? So the, that's a dialectical relationship that works really well. But membranics is then a model. You, you can just expand that. And what's wonderful with anything you discover in philosophy, you can use scales, is that it's so useful. So for example, you've got a town, say a medieval town. Oh, you better protect it because there are robbers everywhere and, you know, Mongols coming and Tatars coming, running on their horsebacks and, you know, whatever. You've got to protect yourself from the outside world, especially women like to be protected. They like an inner sphere within the sphere as well, which you call inner circuit. And then the guys can have an outer circuit. And then you put the shamans at the very end because they don't care where they live or die. And the androgynous guys in between them. So we have these different spheres and they all have their different membranes. So the straight guy's not supposed to walk into a women's hair salon. Only a gay guy's supposed to walk in there because that is a membrane. It's a membrane yeah. to the inner circuit. Women can talk freely with each other and with some gay friends about their lives. And they don't want their straight guys or husbands to hear what they're talking about. So that's another membrane again. And if you look at membranics that way, you can scale it up. And you got the town and you don't put the stupid guy at the port of the town. You've got to have a very clever guy there. Actually, you've got to have a couple of them. And this is actually the origin of the priest and the matriarch and the relationship between the older woman and the priest. Because you often put a priest who has sort of some sane, he has a sane understanding of the outside world. He sort of learned about the outside world. You've got a matriarch who's just an, the wisest person in the entire tribe. She, she's been around. She's seen bullshit going on. She sees who walks up there and she can look at the face and she's hear the tone of the voice or the body posture. She knows whether this guy's a bullshit or not. And of course, the only condition when you come to the membrane is that do you add value if we allow you inside? Okay. Or, or yeah, do you not? It's also, do you fit in the particular place inside, right? If, if you're, you're connecting to your correct, uh, let's say, energetic archetype inside, right? Or otherwise, you could go to another membrane if you didn't belong in that. In that hopefully, sphere. yes. Yeah, hopefully, yeah. yes. But, but hopefully for example, you don't get when, when, I, when I say you. add value, yeah. when I say when I add value, I mean in a very human sense. For example, you can be a cripple and you can be really sick and you go up to the port of the town and they say, oh my God, we got so many older women in here who'd love to take care of you. So we let you in. They'll, mm -hmm. You'll be their human dog for all we care, but you know, we can allow you in because you add value. You can add value in so many different ways, but you must add value. You must be some kind of nutrition to the community you enter when you walk through the membrane. And that is what membranics is all about. Membranics is all about figuring out to which one of these membranes do you go? To which one of these spheres do you apply with your specific skills and your personality type or whatever, yeah. where you could actually add value. So you could also have, you'd also have to just uh, find out who, is the par who has the parasitical relationship and if, if, if there's a parasitical relationship in there and then, and then how, to, how to eject that from the system and, and perhaps have that be transformed somewhere else. Or 
Yes, exactly. So yeah. with Gilles Deleuze, this is rhizomes and, 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 and parasites. He loves parasites, by the way. Mushrooms are fantastic, aren't they? In so many different ways, because they, they add value to the tree and the tree adds value to the mushroom. The, yeah. This is what marriage is for all I care. You know? it's, just, it's just like figuring out how two membranes can meet and sort of intertwine and be you know, enthusiastic and fascinating one another by not understanding one another, but figuring out that somehow babies can come out of this and, you know, property can come out of this and, and social status can come out of this relationship. So why don't we marry? You know, and, and it's much better to look at the world this way because you can then finally figure out why trade routes work and why trade is better than war and things like that. Because you, 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 you develop a method of thinking where it's just like you walk into the room and you ask yourself before anybody else asks themselves, before you go into the room, you ask, will, will I possibly add value when I walk into this room? Or, or am I just here, you know, lurking or sucking energy out of other people? Because then why do I even walk in here? It's offensive for me to walk into this room and try to have a place in this room. And, and this, I think, membranics of this is essential today because we now live in a world of almost 8 billion atoms called humans. They have no idea how to communicate with others. They, they, they're confused about communication. They scream at the top of the lungs. They got the megaphones. We live in the megaphone society. And we're all now getting desperately tired of this. We're tired of ourselves in the sense that there are search for contact, you know, the LinkedIn's of the world, just like sales pitches everywhere. Like, please, can I connect with somebody? Well, if you could figure out who would be interested in communicating with you and whether you'd be interested in communicating with them. If you could figure that out first before you throw yourself at people through advertising and marketing and sales pitches, you can figure that out. Then you're much better prepared for digital than anybody yeah. else. And, and the, the Buddhist term would that, for that would be, you would be creating a mandala. And these mandalas would yeah. be like overlapping or, 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 or you, you would have to have a correct mandala for, for the, whole, you know, the, the whole system to work. Yes, exactly. So you have to yeah. think systematically and dynamically. And that's not what the society of CVs and sales pitches has done for us. I think the society of the CV and the sales pitch is the end of capitalism in a really fundamental sense. I don't mind capital because capital is like energy, blood, electricity. It just flows of things, right? And that can create problems. So can electricity and blood for that matter. But the problem here is that the end of capitalism is that it is the end of advertising, marketing, and screaming at the top of your lungs. It's like, it's like somebody's finally come up to these capitalists in the bazaar and told them, guys, you're screaming too much and you're screaming at everybody and we're sick of you and we call you spam. So we're gonna flush you out because you become shit. We're gonna flush out of our membrane and get rid of you in our society. We yeah. no longer need you. We got algorithms. And algorithm is essentially, it's like when you walk up to the bazaar and you know it's a huge bazaar, there's 100,000 people in there, but you get a map. And the algorithm is a map that if it isn't manipulated or, or corrupted, like Google's algorithms, but you know, if you get a free and open algorithm, it essentially gives you what you're looking for. It knows that I want to go into the bazaar and I'm going to buy a carpet for my mother today. And I don't want to talk to anybody else who talks about anything else and have no spam at all. I just want to go straight to the carpet guys and have carpet. five carpet guys in front of me and then interact with them in, in who's got the most appropriate, you know, affordable carpet. Yeah. Tim was talking at the beginning about how he, he had this feeling that he was sort of changing identities or shifting into new identities or this kind of thing. So it seems to me also that this, what you're describing, there's people who are very fixed within their um, sphere, okay, of yeah. identity. And then there's other people who are really adventuring all the time and moving in and out of overlapping spheres and and uh, and the other thought I had was that the shaman, the shaman, the shaman. This is what just, this is what Tim, too, Tim is shaman. Just, just let me finish. Shamanot. Spheres can't remain too reified. If it, if a sphere is too redefined, it, it probably has to die, and then another sphere has to has to. Um, so there has to be it has to be a living system at all times. That's why we what? are shamanoids here, and that's what Tim is. When Tim just opened up with the sentence, and I I, I throw a th thousand sentences back at him, but. The shamanoid is the guy who we send off first to test a new membrane. Oh, there's a new sphere. Say it's an alien spaceship. Who would you send off to knock the door of the alien spaceship? A shaman. Why? Because he's the only guy who can have any sort of peaceful relationship with the outside world without them killing him because he's a bit mad and he's funny and he's not really one of us. He's already he goes, an alien. He yeah. So the shamans talk to strangers. 
that's why they're so central today, right? How are we going to be cosmopolitan? How are we going to talk to other cultures? Are we going to befriend strangers and trade with them rather than kill them? Shamans, right? So the shaman is the guy who already lives at the very outskirts of the tribe. He's the weirdo guy. He makes his bruise in the forest. He, he likes to be alone and sit and jerk off on drugs. Actually, that's a shaman. So the shaman is the guy you send off because you have no idea how you're going to talk to a new sphere that just moved in. So it's a foreign tribe. It just moved in. Okay. Set off a shaman. He walks over. And if the shaman returns alive and he's not brutally tortured, that's a good sign, right? But the shaman will then tell you, well, I talked to the other guys in the tribe and they have a different language, but I felt what they said. They said something like this. That, that's a first initial incredibly important communication for the possibility of a peaceful relationship with that other membrane. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I get it. I get it. So, yeah, there's there's a really cool place I want to take That's this. Here. Well, Just wait for Andrew there. Yeah, this is where you cut. I just all right, studying cool. membranes at the moment. These are membranes, right? Look at all the spheres within spheres within spheres. Yes, mm-hmm. yes, are, yes. Are, are wombs within wombs within wombs. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. there's dynamic okay. energy. There's the fire below. There's the celestial above, and then there's, you know, all these spheres kind of working with each other. And and anyway, mm-hmm. it's just kind of cool that you're talking about that because it's very much on my mind. <laughs> well, I, you know, I think it's fascinating how there seems to be a wave of memes and philosophical ideas that are resonant among many people right now and i think it's it's odd how much as long as i pay attention to what i need to pay attention to in order to move the energy and come into a more coherent relationship with the transformation of identity as it interplays with all my relationships and the world and the things i'm building then that does in fact bring me to or it sets me up to come to a deeply resonant point with so many other people. Um, You know, and I think that's a good sign. I think that's a good sign. But anyway, um, there's a couple of things I'd like to say, a couple of ideas I'd like to put together here, working off what we've presenced. And it's such a challenging task, actually. It's a really exciting one because, so I've been reading your work very deeply, Alexander, and, um, I love it. I think it's fantastic. Let me say that um, straight off the bat. I said that last time too. Always so fascinating to know how to move to the, uh, I know you guys like places of critical antagony. You know, I know you guys like those places and I, I like those places too. Although I like them most when I feel like there is a shared aspirational spirit to generate coherence from that. Right. So Um, And I feel that very much here, but there's a challenge because when there's such a deep hole of work, right. And, and when the concepts presenced are so important to um, grasp existentially appropriately, how to then move to a point where you might go, "Mm, okay, in here, I want to clarify in here's where I feel like if we poked at, it could open up into this like really fertile ground of conversation without appropriately um, with the right amount of humility, presencing the rest of the structure is a really challenging thing. Um, so I just like to put that, you know, you, uh, there to begin with, because I feel like honestly, there's like an hour and a half's worth of sort of questions leading to the explanation of certain concepts. That I'd prefer to get on the table first before getting to this certain point. However, let me see if I can see if I can sort of get there. It has to do ultimately with the relationship between the Bard absolute, B-A-R-R-E-D, um, not, not your name, obviously, and its experiential and socio-analytical role um, within this structure, um, in this time between worlds, in this transitionary time where our narratives are needing to be reconstructed and we are in this sense sending shamans out into the digital to see just what's possible in terms of establishing vital connection between each other in a way that can um, bring some sort of enduring balance to the power domains of this new era which to be honest are, are fucking um, terrifying you know i actually think digital libido in those last few chapters um 
I don't, I don't read it as an optimistic book in many regards, to be honest with you. I think it's uh, in some sense, deeply pessimistic. Um, really, I, I should, say, I should just say. add that. Yeah. I should just add that the, the point here is that we're writing a trilogy. Mm -hmm. So the first book, Synthism, Creating God in the Internet Age, deals with the concept of utopia. Digital Libido, as a second book, Libido, is meant as the dystopia. So it's like, mm -hmm. yeah, it's got to be mm -hmm. tough, really tough, because we're in a major, massive transition phase in history right now, a paradigm shift. And this is what the, that's why the book gets dark. And that's why it also paints that, okay, if the masses can't follow the elites, this is what awaits them, right? Mm -hmm. For example. Mm -hmm. So it, yeah, yeah it, it should be there on the table. That's exactly why I, I think you should even start with that book. It's better to start with the tough, rough news first if you go through spiritual teaching. But then the utopian version is in a way impossible. That's why the resolution is going to be the third book that we're working on. And we probably need another two years or so, John and I, to write it. But that's a book called Process and Event, which is the protopia. Mm -hmm. So the protopia is like, what is our solution? So mm -hmm. where, where are we going to go next? How are we going to have the ever-refreshed, ever-nude sort of society that we could thrive right. in, where we, can, where we can deal with the problems that the dystopia presents to us? So, so right. yes, it is a dark book, but it's a dark book on purpose. But the yeah. overall message in the, in, in the exodology as a whole doesn't necessarily have to be understood as dark. It's more neutral. Yeah, no, nope, I appreciate that. Fair enough. Um, yeah, so... All right, so... Maybe part of the... Maybe we could take this... Um, this we're most of all speaking about the dynamics of relationship that um confer legitimacy on who gets to enter the inner sanctum versus who stays outside yeah. um and so and 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 that discernment process that relational discernment process seems to be fundamental and in the domain of the shamanistic caste if i'm following correctly and that's been represented through different figures canonically throughout the ages, as you articulate that track, more or less sort of technological epochs. So my sort of current understanding is that our situation is particularly challenging in this time because it seems to be like, I want to tie this actually back into this, um, this funny switch between the recording button on and off because I'm not actually convinced that either of those spaces as we currently have them is in fact that relational channel is in fact that appropriate relational channel. I think we can have a meta conversation about it and that's why I take us in, in some sense to be doing, I could be wrong about this, but that's why I'm focused here. Um, and I think that has to do with the um, degree of real relationship enabled um, for those watching to really participate, which of course is something we're both cognizant of and in our various ways trying to invite. I appreciate what you guys are doing with Parallax and, and inviting people into conversation and what have you. So you obviously see this as the challenge, but we know broadcast is kind of um, old school and ultimately sort of fucked. I mean, we could be much more articulate about that, um, but you know, we can put that to the side for a moment. And then on so the other hand... You're expressing a need to want to invite more people in. That, that's, I think that's what you're saying. Well, sort of. Is that, is that sort of. It, it's sort okay, of that. Okay, I get, I get it. Tim, my suggestion is to talk about accessibility because that's tied to the bar dive. So mm -hmm. Andrews and my critique is that uh, we know that children deserve to be children and should not be treated as adults. Okay, so you can play around during your childhood and you grow. And at certain stages in your life, you're ready to be an adult. The problem these days is probably the opposite one, is that we stay infantilized for most of our lives, right? So uh, that, that is the problem with culture today. But the thing is that accessibility, the dream of universal accessibility to everything, like think of a mm. totally transparent society, is a dream that Islam and Christianity share. And my yeah. critique of that position is that Islam and Christianity are pop religions the vulgarizations of original religion. I think if technology has developed over the last 10,000 years, religion has gone the other way. And, and the reason um, why I make that distinction and why we introduce the barred absolute and we talk about membranics is that 
the board absolute means that you're not ready for this yet. Okay, I had, for example, a long conversation for hours yesterday with a Swedish guy who's one of the heads of the Swedish police. He's, you know, he's gone after the drug dealers for like 20, 30 years. He's sort of made a turnaround in his life. But I also want to listen to his view because we're discussing what should you really do with all these drugs out there? Because drug taking, for example, taking psychedelic drugs, is not something you want a three-year-old to do. You certainly don't want a 30-year-old to experiment with that on his own. Well, then that's part absolutes. It means that you got to put a limit somewhere where you say that you can only do this under certain circumstances and you must be guided by somebody's experience. And actually, you might even be, not be a person who will ever do this. So that's what the barred absolute means. This, if we're going to talk about wisdom seriously, it's not a flat world of 8 billion people babbling, expressing their opinions at all times, because then there's no input. Like I tell a lot of young people who come up to me and say, your problem with your generation is you were fostered to think of yourself narcissistically. You were fostered by social media in the last 20 years to think of yourself as a guy who's got a sales pitch at all time. But you know what? You got nothing to say because you're only 23 and you never read a book in your life. And your ego is not interesting. So they finally wake up to this. It's like a massive spiritual awakening where they finally understand what digital really is. Digital was not about giving you a megaphone. Digital was about you learning more than ever and exploring together with others how fantastic the world is and the potential of things that we can do together. And when they finally get this, it's just like, wow, but I've been completely fooled. Yeah, you were fooled by these telecom companies and tech companies and all these guys who thought user-generated content will be the future. I wrote a paper in 2003 and said, no, I'm sorry, but talent generated and hard work generated content will be the future because there'd be so much content out there. We we'll think of 99% of it as spam. And the only thing we'll be interested in is either something that's so definitely universal that it touches the hearts of almost everyone, which rarely anything can do, possibly at best a Netflix series today or something like that. It can have an almost universal appeal. But in most cases, we're gonna go more specialized. Our conversation here, there are a few hundred or maybe a couple of thousand people that are interested in participating in that, then they're welcome to. But if you try to constantly make everything you do more accessible because you want more people involved in what you do, you become a classical Christian or Islamic preacher who thinks quantity instead of quality and the size of your congregation ultimately is the size of your success. But yeah, I very much wants to go the other focus way. Focus on the quality. Yeah, the, exactly. When you think about it, you say, no, I prefer to go with the quality and be uncompromising and, and work on brilliance and do my very best and find collaborators I can do that with. But when you do that, then you leave these sort of pop religions, you leave pop culture, you leave pop, you leave anything, you leave television, you leave newspaper, you leave radio, you need all these broadcasting mediums that try to have a large audience all the time. Yeah. And I want to trace that and blame that all the way back in Christianity and Islam, because the other religions that didn't go for quantity, didn't go for popularity and stayed within the mysteries, and stayed within the understanding of the world, where Zoroastrianism and Buddhism are Andrews and my choices, could also be Jewish mysticism. Well, for example. Yeah. No, those like religions have Jewish never, they've, ne yeah. I, they've, I, never, I, they've never, they've never ever thought that the contact yeah. directly between God and man was there because it's precisely the idea that God is always accessible to all human beings and he will always give you like no matter what mediocre bullshit you put out there. That is what now digital's finally showing to us that was a myth. Yeah. So it, that that's something that from from a certain perspective i'm not sure i agree with and it's from a it, it, it's not but it's quite an in quite a nuanced way it seems to me like to go through a transformative process itself like rites of passage for instance that there there must be um invitations out there if only you prove yourself worthy to take such that the fulfillment and appropriate participation in that rite of passage enables- You're right, T Tim, you're right, you're right. Okay, so just, just let me say that. A membrane that's not working and is not communicating with the outside world, that isn't curious about the outside world, dies. Mm -hmm. This here dies, there's no nutrition. Yeah. My point is that by keeping an open door and saying, if anybody out there is qualified enough and engaged enough to be part of our conversation, welcome in. And that yeah. we make now universally available. There's a word called open secret that is sort of helpful, right? That you, you, you can come in, but 
you have to be able to come in, right? To get the secret, you have to be able to get it. If you don't get it, you're not going to come in, right? You just it's just going to it's a natural sort of process. Yeah, yeah, I've been and, using and that you, yeah. It's an and open you communicate secret. To, and yeah, you communicate to a certain extent that this is available to all. Yeah. This is available to a few, and this is available only for the initiate. And that's again membranes. Okay, so we're getting close. We're getting close to this point of criticality that I that I want to go to because this the sermon about um, what constitutes getting the open secret in this time of radical transformation that that can can be subject to being faked. What do I mean by fake? Um, fake is probably not the best word, but it can certainly be subject to someone speaking all the right memes and actually having had certain deep and powerful experiences that might even enable a sort of a deeper sense of existential grounding in the sublime and chaos of life than some of those perhaps even inside. Um, You're talking about the cult, right? I mean, that's the cult. Yeah. Uh, compared I'm, to the, 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 the community, and the community has a porous membrane, right? The, the community is not, a, not an enclosed uh, system where you're worshipping one principle and everybody is bound to that and, and a, a kind of a slave to that. It's, it's a dynamic system where everyone has a beautiful place to, and they can come in and out uh, on some level. That's like, why I talk about the old woman sitting at the port. Like you gotta have I, like, a very old I, this... But wait, I, yeah, I gotta have an so old go experienced person sitting yeah. at the port of the membrane because she will she will she will find the bullshitting part where it's not yeah. just the fancy words and the pretended substance. But and the door has, has to be always open. You have to always be able to leave, right? You, you know, you're you, you know <laughs> you can't you can't be if if then it becomes a prison or a cult or a I think. Well, not well. You can have membranes on the way out, like uh, mm -hmm. you got a marriage arrangement, for example. You've signed on to something. It's got to be a bit of an effort to get divorced to get out of it. So, yeah. actually, to make people committed to something as well, it, it's not. It's a, we can't have the open door policy any longer. Oh, we can't oh, have I people see. walking in out as they wish. We we got it. We have figured out that oh my god, private has to come back. We can't be public all the time because otherwise we're going towards some kind of a transparency nightmare. Byung Shul Han, the Korean philosopher, writes a lot about this. Like, if we have the transparency society, he's even written a book called that. Mm -hmm. If we have a society where we have this mythology of transparency all the time that anybody can walk mm -hmm. in and out as they wish, well then we're just raping each other's minds constantly. It, 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 it's, well, it's I'd horrible. say it's very hard to get in. And it's 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 very easy to leave once you're in because you have to, you have to go through all the uh, the trials and tribulations to get in and once you're in okay you're welcome in here but you could go anytime. No, no, no. That's a fantasy. That's and, a and you probably can't go because you've invested so much in it. But no, but that's like saying I can take out a loan out of a bank whenever I like and never pay it back. You got to understand that. Actually, no, 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 no. I'm yeah. saying you pay, you pay, you pay, you pay first, and then you get in. Uh, you know, you but then it's not easy to leave because most people don't have the money to pay to get out without a loan. So my mm -hmm. point is this, uh, Andrew, that to allow people to get further and further in towards the inner sanctum in any system, say go towards wisdom, right? Mm -hmm. You also commit yourself on the way. And finally, I, I can assure you this one oh, yeah. thing. If you're going to go into the very inner sanctum of any religion or any mystery of any kind, you've got to devote your entire life to it before oh, yeah. you're allowed in. That's absolutely No, true. it's not. It's not that we got to get rid of the idea that we can walk in and out. of it. It's capitalism built on Christianity and Islam as pop religions that created the West. I always talk of the West as the Middle East and, and then Europe added in North America. So anything West of the Gobi Desert, but where the ontology started. We, we went a different path in the East, right? But the West, with the pop religions we had, and eventually with the arrival of capitalism, gave us the idea that here's a supermarket and we want everybody to come and buy stuff from us. And we have everything offered. Just come in and stay here. And you can walk out anytime you like if you don't like it. No, no. These what I, that's not what I'm saying. Walking in out, do not I'm saying the guy anything. goes to the Zen monastery and he has to stay out there in the cold and dark for days, right? And then and then and then and then finally they let him in. And he, he does he does the practice and he's committed or or he goes, right? Yeah, then they uh, kick but, him but out. They're, they're, what? 
That's what I'm saying. It, like, yeah. Anyway, I, I think, wanna, I, think I think yeah. I think the we're reason why there could be a disagreement here is just what matters is the duration involved. I think for the kind of inner sanctum here that Alexander might be considering is actually in order to commit to do the work to be part of that is to commit over a long period of time fundamentally mm -hmm. because these rituals we engage in right these um these 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 worlds to be created these things to be built i mean it's god it's no it's no joke obviously it's like years of experimentation and failure and what holds that together is a certain relational commitment to integrity and meeting those waves of frustration and and difficulty with each other over a long period of time and so you know is that i think that's probably what's yeah, what's the I, thing here. i think we fundamentally agree i yeah. What I'm saying is that there will be nobody in, in, in the community that I would, would have a gun to my head saying you have to have to stay here. I, I right. would be deeply right. of course. To, to, to stay of my own religion, Yeah, the, right? the, the sovereignty, That's the sovereignty of choice to continue to affirm one's participation. I mean, without that, there's no integrity to the relationship at all. It's just that. But like no, no, I, I actually disagree here, although weekly. Okay. I think the idea of sovereignty is one of these things, one of these neg negations we've developed over time to think of as a positive when it really isn't. For example, Karl Marx properly said that the reason we got rid of slavery wasn't because we became good people. That's just a myth. The reason we got rid of slavery was the capitalism taught the capitalists that it was too expensive to keep people, to pay for people 24 hours a day and also pay for the children. It was much better to just pay for one guy at a time, eight hours a day, and it's called work. And then we turned it into mythology that work is better than slavery. And then afterwards, of course, we could say that work had certain benefits. And then we attribute those to the people who wanted to battle slavery were prophets and they were nice people. But this is like, it's the same thing here. I, my problem with sovereignty and the sovereign individual is that it's a, it's a judicial term developed so we could lock up people in prison. We yeah, got to I'm understand using it in sovereignty a different is, way. It's a negative idea originally. Sovereignty is that we do not have to take responsibility for you any longer, but we can hold you responsible for what you do within a system. So we can actually maximize and, and get the cream out of you, but you won't get much back. And, and I, I just want to emphasize that, that human beings are deeply tribal animals. And what we're trying to do here is to try to construct how do we, how do we both for people allow as many membranes as possible to become accessible when they should be accessible? And how do you also allow the spheres inside these members to be as intelligent, as smart as possible so that they don't miss out on the opportunities of connecting with people who are talented? So what's yep. the difference then between the Sangha and the tribe? Because the tribe seems to be a given, right? You're born into a tribe. And a Sangha seems to be something that people, you know, you, you go in and you involve, you, you, you intentionally decide to be involved in this, in this, in this community. So there must no, be a difference between a tribal community and, and, and an intentional community. No, on, no, that's on, a very no. modern European American interpretation of how you join a community. You don't, you, you don't apply. Well, you could be born into it as a child. In. But, yeah. but hey, most of us, hey, if we're. No, wait, wait a second, Andrew. If you go back 200 years, and that's not a yeah. long period, right? There's no way you choose and you went no, into. No, no, agree. But there's now, no way you, you you did religious education as a market. But I, do I want to do that or that or that? No, 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 not at all. That's a very Californian sort of contemporary. Well, you mythology. chose to be a Zoroastrian. I chose to be a Buddhist, right? That's now, yes, historically. Yeah, now, well, historically, so I'm talking that was about now. Case. I'm talking about. I am talking about now. I'm saying. I'm, I'm saying what these communities that are arrive, arising now, okay? There, there's something oh, okay. tribal, no, no, tribal wait a is, is wait a traditional. Wait a second, wait a second. I studied seven damn years and I learned of Vesta mm -hmm. and I became a scholar. Then I was accepted to the Zoroastrian community. It well, is not a mass proselytizing. Oh no, like I agree. I, I, I did yeah. bazillion Membrane again. Yeah, uh, membrane again. I did not choose it. It chose me. Okay. So it's... Uh, uh, and I think okay. that's why it's uh, that why these things are important to you and me and Andrew, because we are convicted that this is the future. We're convinced that this is the future. It's not about ease accessibility any longer. It's gone so vulgar. Yeah. Anybody who stands in the street and tries to sell their wares, uh, it, it's time to sort of do Christ's move, which is to throw the merchants out of the temple just for once and clean it from all the spam, because in, in reconstruct the temple, what actually you got to prove why you should be, why you should have accessibility to this sphere. But okay, Tim, what's your concern here? I want to hear more about Tim's, can, can, like what he's, what yeah. he's trying to get at, because I, I don't think he's gotten, gotten there yet. Uh, I, think, I, th I, th I think we're getting there. Um, well, in order to get there, where I was just coming from regarding the term sovereignty, I mean something like, um, like dignity of choice as uh, unique 
individual necessarily involved nodal relationship within as a whole within the whole in a process of ongoing whole making and to the extent that that is um, disenabled in any group whatsoever that's a that's a making a hard cut that leads to me in a kind of opposition and fundamentally a kind of conflict that may end up having to be violent and that's let's say not healthy unless one is opposing someone who's in fact doing that to them or others so um that like the disagreement i wouldn't it's 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 more it's more it's more whether or not um i feel satisfied actually that the that that the the conversational landscape itself that the space of interaction itself is itself experimental enough in undergoing the kind of <laughs> let's go at it this way because this is something i'd be fascinated to to turn let's turn in this direction um i'm, I'm curious about your like presencing a phenomenological first person perspective of relationality with the bard absolute often these conversations you know socioanalysis is is one of the, probably the main theme of of the, your podcasts and let's see if we can make the switch to speaking about the sort of inside out psychoanalytic perspective as perhaps has manifested through whether psychedelic experiences or other kinds of criti critical experiences with the sublime if we can use that language um i it's it's because it's because because here it is right there are conversations i want to have that maybe they should be taking place privately and yet i feel like the establishment of the rituals enabling of appropriate relationship regarding that subject matter is also something that has to take place within many many within and among many people but the place we're in from my lim very limited perspective here very limited perspective is that these conditions for conversation and nodal interaction are themselves emerging and it's in some ways at least in my life may not have arrived so so i'm feeling and it's why like this may be the last podcast episode i record for maybe a long time is that much of what i want to discuss is maybe more appropriate to to discuss not recorded and yet the signals that could be sent out from those conversations to some people might be absolutely necessary for catalyzing and cohering the kind of distributed tribe that's in fact necessary to bootstrap this exodus <laughs> that we're talking about do you see like the tension i'm trying to get at? yeah uh, and, and the name for that is walls so uh there is a space between public and private and that's fantastic. We human beings are very innovative. That's called dialectics. So, okay, private has certain, uh, uh, you know, uh, benefits, which is non-recording button here, and then public means recording button. But they can be recording button and edit, and depending on what headline you put on it, the algorithms will either find it or not find it. You can hide mm -hmm. in the jungle these days, right? Mm -hmm. In the information jungle. And you can also put it behind a wall and say that uh, we have some material available here behind a wall. And uh, we just want to make sure that it doesn't get into the wrong hands and that the people who actually participate in that material, that's what we do mm -hmm. these days, right? Mm -hmm. Are then invited to be part of it. And that's what, why I'll talk about digital monasteries all the time. Mm -hmm. A digital monastery clearly has a membrane, it has a wall, and certain students go inside and they then share. And also we all know that people open up a lot more when they know that not everybody can listen. You, mm -hmm. If you want to make a pornographic movie and be, be experimental, you don't want your mum to be at the set, right? So, <laughs> so again, that, that again, why well, talk about Another membranics, concrete right? Another example from Alexander, yeah. But I think that's a given to him. I don't worry about that. I, I, be innovative as you are already. That's why you're great. And be shamanic and experiment a lot and keep experimenting in between the private and the public, which means recording button on, but what you then do with the material after you recorded it becomes a different thing. And that can then spin off in different directions. The other thing you talked about though first, which I want to tie into, is you actually talking about Hegelian subjectivity, the Hegelian subject, we talk about the sovereign individual in the way you do. And that's because 
we're embodied minds and we all believe that we believe that you know body and mind are one right and and and, and we're embodied mind and we're individuals and that's the minimum size we have of a human society and then these individuals then construct different formations and they tend to go towards the structure we call tribal so they tend towards to go towards this 157 number the number number all the time because they feel very comfortable there so they, they, they did something unique we can use a lot. And for example, you discover that you, you can actually have, say you got a men's camp like Andrew and I do here in Europe. And you take 150 men off and a couple of leaders or teachers and it works wonderfully for the next four days because everybody's comfortable with that size. It's big enough to be intelligent and thriving and alive, but it's not too big for you to feel like an outsider not understanding what's going on. So you get the balance between the order and the chaos that's created exactly that size. So that is why I talk about these larger projects. But when it comes to them, this individual being sovereign, yes, the good thing about the enlightenment in Europe in the 1600s forward was the work towards individualism and the price to take with us from individualism was that the individual is a sovereign and we're all equal before the court of, you know, before the rule of law, at least we should be. And these principles are great. And that means that I do not violently interfere on your sphere that means that you decide where you want to be and i decide where i want to be and if we then find out that oh we are shared interests then these two spheres can be combined in different ways so we can work together but the problem with the enlightenment the monocant is that the monocant gets lost in the subject versus object relationship and what hegel essentially does with his subjectivity ironically he said is by emphasizing and clearly deeply understanding what subjectivity is in relation to substance, it's an inside and outside world. So Hegel is the original membranicist, is that he discovers that, yeah, the subject would then like to submit to something that Hegel calls the absolute. And that's when I would use the word subject, object, and project. Because once you decide you got a shared project, you also share the different responsibilities and specialties within the group that go for this project. The phallic is always a project, right? It's, it's always like, we gotta go there. We gotta create a better world or, or we gotta go to a different place or to the promised land or whatever you like. But, or we just gotta build a building, right? We gotta build a skyscraper or a temple for that matter. So say we gotta build a temple somewhere here in say North America, that's a good place to go. Say Northern Canada, big temple gotta build. That's a project and a project requires that a lot of people become cannon fodder and, and hard workers at the bottom. And it requires a certain priestly leadership, which is the plan and, and the architecture. And it requires a certain royal leadership, which is the biggest guy who goes before everybody else, the other guys can mimic, and then build, 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 right? So these functions, the royal, the priest, etc., demand a hierarchy. And that's what hierarchy is. Hierarchy is always tied to project. And that's when your subjectivity is not that interesting any longer because the subjectivity is basically, yes, I would love to be part of a product that's bigger than myself. Mm -hmm. And that is much more grand of me as a human being than just sitting here on my own as an isolated atomic little island, always talking about myself all the time. And I think yeah, this is- you get to that point, don't happens. you? There's a point where, you're, you, you get, where the project becomes more interested in you than, than you. <laughs> And when right. you join a religion, that's exactly what you admit to. Yeah. When, you, when you go into marriage with a woman or, or a man, for that matter, mm -hmm. you commit to something that's bigger than both of you. You want to create yeah. something bigger than both of you. And I love how human beings, because of the tribal nature, construct and build these projects all the time. Now, a project can then become some kind of sick cult or a sect. It, it can isolate itself from the outside world. It can be centered on a damn narcissist at the center or a tyrant even. You get Nazi Germany. The problem with membranics is that membranes can build spheres that are incredibly destructive. Fortunately, they die after a while because they have no nutrition added. Nazi Germany was doomed from day one. But after 11 years of havoc and 100 million people died, he finally, finally Hitler himself killed himself because he was consequential with his ethics and killed himself. He said, the Russians have been the Germans. I'm a German, I'll kill myself. Okay, at least he was a Nazi all the way through. But 100 million people had died. And we live with the trauma ever since in history. And at least, you know, the projects can go terribly wrong. And I want to do a philosophy on how do you build products that are sustainable and prosperous and grow over time and stay protopian? And how do you avoid building products that go down the loop? And, and this is where we talk about exoduses and lynch mobs. Because these are the ultimate human products over time. And the exodus is the name of the productive, constructive project that has its aim to build a new world. Whereas the lynch mob 
it's the exact dirty, nasty, destructive opposite of tensions being released, where you go for somebody innocent and abject and kill him and release the tension for a while, after which it returns again. So I wonder if, Tim, your reticence about you know, speaking public, does that have something to do with the lynch mob, or, or is it something to do with just your feeling that, 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 uh, that you need to go in, in more inward and work on, 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 on your project yourself? Like, what's mm. going on there? Like, I, I, yeah. I, you know, it's very awkward to speak in public, isn't it? I mean, unless you're very gifted at it, like Alexander, it's like, um, you, you, you have trial and error and then you get all this feedback and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Um, so one word that was here. coming up for me, uh, just earlier on is, was dedication fundamentally. It's like the, the subjectivity has becomes the quality of dedication to the project. Right. So for me to live through the transformation uh, invariably has to come back and be grounded on coming again into appropriate dedication in in being in in the world so and there's a bunch of things that influence what then i can do like capacity is a big one um i would continue to speak publicly if i was convinced that i could um manage the energy of it and still have enough left over to do the other things I know that should be done. But the issue is for me, and this has been the case for a long time, is that my vision has been much greater than my capacity to actualize for various reasons. And now I'm witnessing a whole bunch of what I saw needed to happen start to happen. You know, other people are doing things better than I could. They were better positioned, more skilled in certain ways. And so then they're becomes a process of channeling well what's my place in this what if i was to dedicate continue, continue to dedicate myself what's the best thing i can be doing to effectively do something like co-create this emergent co-create modulate help to build this network of relationship that's in touch enough with the vitality of life the you know the um the uh, libidinal uh, potentiality of the future um, um, takes itself deeply seriously, but can still uh, find a kind of lightness and joy in the process. Like, how can I, how can I help bring about this kind of internodal world that I feel. I like know I it already. I'm, I'm, I'm going to spoil the fun here. What you're doing is fantastic. It's called retraction. Simon Critchley, the British philosopher, has written beautifully about retraction. He says, revolution is a myth. What human beings should do is to retract. Pull yourself back. Because in, in both Zoroastrianism and Buddhism, we always talk about uh, body and, 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 and speech and mind. So it's body, speech, and mind. Like, uh, and And when your body has exhausted itself or you you no longer have words for what you're going to do or your mind is exhausted you just retract for them to catch up and then you pay most attention to that part of the three where you're lost and it's funny you should say it, when we mean speech we mean mantra for example mm -hmm. and when we mean mind you mean meditation in buddhism and and the gate the mudra which is the body and this is like in Zoroastrianism, the same thing and, and when I wake up in the morning, my Zoroastrian's meditation starts with this. What I think will determine how I speak, what I speak, how I speak will determine how I act, and how I act will determine how I think the next day. Mm -hmm. So it's like a loop, mm -hmm. right? You see yourself that loop. And, and all you need to do is to retract yourself and see a big, bigger picture. But I think I've got it already, and it's within our own networks here. I think P what Peter Lindbergh is doing with the Stoa in Canada right now is absolutely fantastic. And I don't even want you to match yourself with him because what he's doing is he's putting in so much hard work. And we're all thinking, when is he going to be so exhausted he can't work any longer? Because it's fantastic. But what Tom, our friend Tom, is doing with Andrew's support is building parallax in Europe. And I just talked to Peter Lindbergh yesterday and said, the Stoa is just, the, 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 that's the west of the Atlantic and parallax is east of the Atlantic. You guys think so alike. It's precisely between politics and spirituality. It's precisely between the old and the new paradigms. It's precisely in this sphere where you're interested in being right now and you're great at it and you thrive within that environment. And you get both, you know, 
this sort of here's spirituality and here's religion, but also politics and art. And you get all these things intermerging with each other in conversation with one another. And you love arranging conversations. Tim, you're so much alike Peter and Tom. Is that you're on fire about arranging those conversations, being the mm -hmm. node in that network. That yeah, we'll see where you arrive. You decide. You're sovereign. You decide. But I just planted the idea. I think at the back of your head, you haven't thought about it already. That yes, uh, an Australian protopian digital monastery in Melbourne would be a really, really good idea. That could collaborate with guys sitting in you know Majorca and in, in Toronto doing very similar things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, something like that is what I've been looking at for a while, a long, you know, uh, quite a while. You know, I, I could take this conversation quite a few, quite a few different ways from here, I think. Um, yeah, I mean, status is an interesting thing. So I should say as well that I've like, I've recorded a bunch of stuff that's already sort of private. Right. And I, I actually hate organizing conversations. Like I, I really don't much care for, it's so sacred actually sending an invitation. I call it a sacred art of invitation making. Cause I think the dynamics of invitations and then fulfillment is like fundamental to this relationship. And there's something actually almost metaphysical about it in terms of how I think. Um, but I don't, like that they can be left hanging i um don't like of i don't like continually having to adjust to a kind of nebulous unmade channel of interaction that is separate to an actual being here together uh, i'm not an organizer of things in that regard um, but i need to take a lot longer to continue to develop my own thought for instance you know and to do the work in that sense um so that's one thing i want to do um but otherwise, do you have a team do you have a team around you because peter and tom do no i mean that's been okay. the main that, that's, that's been the main why, capacity that's probably why main you issue. are retracting that's why you want to retract <laughs> and you should retract and you do it gracefully and wonderfully retract and start thinking who could you collaborate with that are actually physiologically or graphically close to you, close to your mm -hmm. butt, as I say, uh, and start working with those people. Cause, cause if you create a team, uh, deep, you know, <laughs> if you create a team down under, if you complement yeah. the sort of things we see happening in North America, you're, you're perfect for it. Tim. You'd be absolutely perfect for it. Absolutely. Yeah. That's the next step, right? Yeah. Uh, in a sense, or could be the next step. I mean, well, we have the indigenous culture here, you know, like if if i stay in australia then it would be outrageously remiss not to journey into the desert fundamentally but i also don't want to pressure that process you know like that's something that has to come to you as much as you push for it as well and i've done a lot of pushing i've done a lot of pushing you know i've gotten where i am because i've pushed out it's it's and i feel that it's like whoa trying to follow something more subtle maybe is, but I, I want to put more effort into voicecraft.network. So that's what I'll be doing. That's what we call a Hegelian subjectivity that is retracting from its finished project to look for a new project. And the way you do it, you go to the root of the phallus. Sorry for sounding very Freudian here. The root of the phallus is if you want to be phallic again, meaning you want to have a project you're excited about. Okay. Then you go back into history. And in your case, you're bicultural because you moved into a culture, bringing another culture with you. That means you are bicultural. So the way you interact with that is you knock on the membrane, mm. say, for example, on Aboriginal culture in Australia and, and indigenous culture. And, and then you try to explore what has it meant for people who lived here for 50,000 years rather than just 300 years. Can I interact with them? Will they allow me in? Can I, can I bring nutrition to the door? Before I go into there and say, whatever root of the fellows I have, my ancestry that I have with me, I bring with you and see, can we make amends and see what could come out of that? So that, that's exactly how you think. You, you, you think retraction is you go deeper down and you go mm -hmm. back into your own lineage. That's why the Bible is full of all these long, long, long lines of he was the son of who was the son of who was the son of who was the son. Because you try to claim lineage to create claim credibility, but it's also your own journey. That is why I talk about deeper history, not just deep history, but deeper history today with data and everything we have. We need to know history better. We need to rewrite history all over again, properly this time, hopefully, and much better than we did in the past. For example, rewriting the history of Asia, which is a project I'm heavily involved with. Hmm. And 
yeah, that's a good, that's a really good place to start. But mm -hmm. I would also start looking around. Don't do the solo show. The solo show is the last remnant of the age of individualism. It's over. And the internet, the first thing it teaches us is that the guys who do the solo shows are the newsletters we throw in the spam box right away. But the people who look for people to collaborate with, both geographically where you live and then digitally because then they can be anywhere on the planet, like the intellectual deep web, for example. Do both on both levels. You can work both in digital, which is global, and you can work locally, which is physical. And find a team. I work from mm -hmm. there. Yeah, it's close. It's close. It's um, there's a there's a lot of people. I mean, collaboration with uh, various levels, but it, it's taken me to go to drop a lot of that energy I was putting out there to actually have the bandwidth to properly attend to those. So I'm excited about what's around the corner in that regard. But um, yeah, no, I'm I'm on board, and I feel that's um, you know, that's a nice way of framing it. But I'm conscious now we've been speaking about me a little bit. <laughs> and I, yeah, I, but it's actually, oh. it is actually practice protopianism. And that's what we're working mm -hmm. on anyway. So mm -hmm. yeah. I, I think it's, the... it's an example of the conversation. And Peter Lindbergh, the Stoa, and, and Tom Eichler, and Parallax, uh, who Andrew works with a lot. Um, yes, check out these guys too, because that's why we have this conversation. Because what Tim is doing in Australia reminds us so much for me and Andrew of what these guys are doing in Canada and in Spain. Yeah, well, I was talking to Peter quite, a, you know, we had a, a few conversations at the end of last year. And, um, you know, so initially this project for me was called Voice Club and he had Intellectual Explorers Club, you know, where they spoke about intellectual ideas in a kind of club and we were using their voices and we used our voices in a club to speak about intellectual ideas. So, you know, there, there was a lot of similarity there. Um, yeah, you have to be on fire, right? That's, that's the thing. Uh, yeah, Peter's on fire uh, at the moment. Yeah, and he, he has this momentum going that's amazing. And he'll just keep going and going and going. Well, the great guess, thing with this... Going, he is probably this, at one point going to be kind of explode and he's going to have to sort of, you know, he's going to have to do what you're talking about. He's going to have to retract and, uh, and let other people take the reins. But he's he's created a living thing, I think. He's created a living... But the great thing with the internet... Which is not is, just it, a bunch of yeah. cliches. The, or, the internet is not yeah. tied to television. And television has two terrible things. The equivalent to television is a banal talk show. And mm. the talk show finally became a place where celebrities took tons of coke to be able to talk about themselves once more and walked in to promote a book or a movie or something. And then they went out and the next guy came in. That is the best television could do compared to this. That's how bad television is. These living, thriving conversations we're having right now, do not put them on a schedule. Do not make one a week. Because that's just imitating tabloid and imitating tabloid television. You don't have to. Go into a mode, retract. Wait mm -hmm. till you got the energy and clear vision and a project. Get the people mm -hmm. you need to, to achieve that product. Go in with full enthusiasm and do it and put it out there because you will be out there forever once you've done it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, perhaps in another conversation, I could share quite a bit of my thinking in exactly this regard, because I've been looking at these structures for quite a while, and I have built quite a bit of thinking about it. So in terms of these mutual learning environments is a term that Nora, ba Nora Bateson uses, you know, that we were speaking before um, about this, this coming into the membranics coming into the inner sanctum or what have you, and that people need to do a certain amount of work to then be accepted. But what, what's interesting is the thing people are proposing here is not actually the completed article. It's, it's proposing a, a community to come into of ongoing learning processes as well. Cause the thing is to be built like this, the dynamics of these digital communities in terms of what sort of collective intelligence and various ways to filter and orient people so that they can meet the people they should be meeting and interacting with and navigating their way appropriately what that is is still to is very much still to come but it's an ongoing learning process that everyone's collaborating in and so in that sense i don't think you need to do eight years of work to open to to come into that space Right, but there are certain ways of conducting. No, but I, 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 Tim, I think that space will die because I think that construction is naive. And my critique, what I call the California mythology, is the critique of the romanticism of the flat. We fooled ourselves with the internet because it cost us nothing to go online. It cost us nothing to open the Gmail account or the Facebook account or the Twitter account or the Instagram account and go into social media. It was made available for free because we traded our data instead of trading your money. That created a dream, an old Rousseauian dream, 
oh, we're all equals and we must treat each other as equals and always be in equal conversations with one another. That's not how wisdom works. Sorry. No, I, I don't mean that. I wisdom, mean accum like I can, wisdom accumulates after a while. And what then happens is that out of the flat comes the Orwellian, there are some who are more equal than others, rather than speaking openly about the fact some people know more about certain shit than other people do. And you know what the problem is? The problem is that those who know more than other people do will find it hard and harder to be accessible to others because there will so many people around them, they will just start closing off and create a stronger membrane around themselves and close them off. And that, that is why I think it's better to create conversations where you say from day one, this is a flat conversation. Anybody goes into this room, you know, talks to each other on a flat set. And at least we got a guy at the door again. So not, you know, a troll walks into the door and destroys the whole thing. You, you know that one guest at dinner party can ruin a dinner party. And the second you know that, you know, you got to put a guy at the, at the port. But you can still create a fantastic possibility of having a flat space. For example, if you go to Burning Man, flat space. Then within a camp, you can have a hierarchy. And, you know, because a camp to be built has to be product. But the, but the festival itself is fantastic and very communist and beautiful because it's flat. But when it comes to actually, for example, learning something properly or building something properly or changing the world radically, it takes tons of effort, hard work, deep studies, years of work. Then you will discover very quickly that the people who become the nodes, even the nodes of the nodes that you're aspiring to be, the Peter Lindberghers and Tom, all the nodes, will be so confronted by people who see them as a break. If, 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 I, if I can only be on your show, you know, success will be mine. Well, at the end of the day, I worked in the music industry. We had thousands of demo cassette tapes or, or CDs every day from people who thought that they were the God's gift to mankind when it came to music. And we knew that 99.9% .9 of it was, was just mediocre crap that mimicked somebody who was better. And, and this is the tragedy of humanity that, is that we th they throw you at themselves, they throw you at you. And then if your network is easily run and hardly any people apply to it, it's probably not very good to be honest about it, or it's just fresh and not known yet. But if your network has been around for a few years and you still have problem finding people who are interested in joining it, <coughs> you should fold it. <laughs> it's not a good network, right? But a good network actually gets these nodes, we call it nodalization. And that is what wisdom also is, both knowledge, information, and humans become nodes. And once you get to the top of that node, you will experience what it's like to be a star within a system. Everybody wants your ass. They want a piece of you and you can't give them that. Yeah, so I, I, feel, like, I feel like I want to resist that dynamic and that I think... How could you do that and still create something meaningful and valuable? Well, isn't that, isn't that the whole... It, it, it's not the whole thing, but, you know, so thinking about the Ubermensch as one rather than a group, what, what about a guild? What about these, what about having an understanding of styles of cognition? What about having a balance? To join a guild, you have, have to work for years as a disciple with the masters. And it, you're not even guaranteed you're going to get your diploma. And only we got the diploma, you've been out there for five years. Will you be allowed to join the guild? It's a perfect example of what I call membranics. High membranics, sophisticated membranics. Right, no, right, right. Yeah. The, prob the, pro the problem with contemporary culture in general is that it's commercialized and it's coming out of pop religion and pop culture. And the problem with that is that we've promised everybody everything is accessible. And now people realize they can't pay their way in and they think the connections are going to get them in. Can you get me through the door? It's like, it's yeah. like a nightclub of a million people want to get in, but there's only places for 500 well, in there. There's also a question of co contribution, right? If you think of the Jews and how much they've contributed to culture and how many Nobel Prize, they, they hardly even have a country. Uh, you know, people don't even think they exist, right? Uh, uh, people, a lot of people, most, a lot of people want to kill them, right? But, but, uh, but the, the, the Jews, for example, they had this very small, powerful religion. Right, and they wrote a book, and and uh, you know, and they had. Uh, I, I I I don't think there's anything more powerful in the West than than, than Judaism, but it, but it's still a small, uh, you know, relative to the other religions, uh, a bunch of uh, a bunch of sort of eccentrics uh, with a lot of laws and rules and 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 things that you have to you know you can't just you definitely can't just walk in the door and and. Um, on the other hand, the ethics of it is is really for for the world. Like they're at the, although they're the chosen people, they're chosen for the world, so they want to help the world. So it's kind of 
it's a kind of uh, they've been kind of successful at that. Um, so there's a, there's this sort of paradox between the universalism and elitism um, that I see there. Uh, I think that Alexander's trying yeah, to express I, I, it. I, I, people absolutely like me right. Join the religion. What, that's what I joined an actual religion. I, I didn't want to invent my own religion. Uh, I, I came to that conclusion at one point that I that I, <laughs> you know that, that that would that would be sort of um, that would be sort of uh, a, a hippie dream, uh, right? Uh, but you did start you know, a podcast was, with a guy who's doing something pretty similar to that. No, yeah, I'm not. I am both. I'm both going back for a thousand years, and I'm a converted Zoroastrian, and I'm also declaring synthism. And before the synthism book was published, I went to see my mobile comrade on Yamshidi in Paris. He looked at the book and said, "Great, you done Zoroastrianism without all the Iranian nationalism attached to it. Perfect. <laughs> You're basically saying the same thing again. Great, because that was the point. My point is that religion does not have to be reinvented at all. We've left religion. We need to go back to religion. Technology is what we're inventing." So the point here is that these religions that we study, Zoroastrianism, Vajrayana Buddhism, and Judaism are smaller, more quality focused, built by people who retracted, considered carefully what they were doing, focused on the quality, didn't care about the quantity. That's why those religions will survive. I think the end of pop culture is also ultimately the end of pop religion. And out of the axial age came these sort of easy, simplistic ideas that Islam and Christianity unfortunately are. I'm convinced that's the case. If you promise people they're gonna live forever and no matter what they do, and they don't have to pay a price for it, you're lying. <laughs> you're lying. They're gonna die when they die. You know? So so well, it's the most that's... seductive promise as well, too, because it's like saying, okay, here's open the door and God will be there. Uh, you don't have to do anything for it. You know, God but, uh, is just right the there question... behind the you just the door is wide open. Come on in yeah. and 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 and, bra and God is right there waiting for you. Um, yeah. But the thing here is with Tim here is, Tim, you do not have a choice. This is pure logos. This is pure logic. If you create a successful network where actually quality is being delivered constantly, tons of people will apply to be part of it. What are you going to do? Because the more people you let in, the lower the quality will be. And eventually you'll kill it. All right. So here's, well, this is a space to be generative in then. What do you guys think of creating games? Here's an example. Is actually one that would be super fun to play. This is just one of so many games, but you might have seen um, Lawrence Curry Clark about who magistering what he calls the glass bead game after the Herman Hess book. So the idea with this game is that in many respects, it's just working with the creative energy that we're already expressing here. And I think that's important to say from the offset, like, but, you can play in one minute turns, two minute turns, five minute turns, but it's, a sem it's essentially improvisational philosophy, improvisational generativity with each other, developing a, essentially a collective voice of exploration and integration. So there's a way to actually evolve ideas and be integrous with respect to that, which becomes quite evident in playing with someone. You get to know someone pretty well pretty quickly so it's an example of a kind of relational modality um which that's can have a, real a religious output. um that's what you do in a religious feast kind of like uh where you you generate all of these games these i mean you generate all of these um you know uh, psychotechnological play and uh and then and then and then you generate a mandala right uh, and and then and then yeah i think that's what that's what that's what the I think that this quality of game game is 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 at the heart of of uh, what what a genuine religion would be would be because it wouldn't be separate from art and it would be a communal art form. Yes, yes, um, a, a shared so. participation in 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 creating art together, and I think that is mm. fundamentally we can understand the channels of that as grounded in like things like cognitive style, things like. Um, uh, like I've got on the wall right behind me, I've got like different classes of generative seats around the table, as it were. Like, I think it's very important to have people that are oriented towards like exclusion in the sense of um, does the code compile or not? And then people that are also geared towards inclusion in the sense of are we appropriately caring for all that we could be in caring relationship with? Now, we want to each have a sense of the whole together. 
but we do have primary, you know, focuses. So certain channels of generative roles in collective making of art and generation together, I think they're the kind of things I will be experimenting with, you know, outside of the public exactly space. But then presenting them when you can channel people coming through processes who then go, oh yeah, this is someone who in the, you know, domain specific knowledge area of, you know, this angle of philosophy and this thing, and we're going to be speaking about this, you know, particular subject. They've kind of got that covered, got people there from a more feeling tone, from a sense of kind of intuitive vision, you know, um, that's like in there. And maybe that, that, could, that the, but, the, but this is where art and religion are different. Uh, when it comes to art, that works and works wonderfully. That's what I talked about Bernie Man. Mm. That's a flat is, and art can be accessible because if you get it, you get it. But if you don't get it, you walk by it anyway. And a lot of stuff like that don't have to be moderated. Then can be presented. They can be transparent. I'm all for transparency when transparency is possible and makes sense, right? But. The problem is, this is why I talk about the root of the phallus before you try to build the phallus. So the root of the phallus is what you have to do before you start your project. That is that, how did you learn this trade? Or have you learned it? I mean, did you get a proper education? Did, 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 you, become, did, did you learn how to do something? Because like, yeah, we can all play around in a room, for example, and express ourselves artistically. But the question is, uh, how do you learn how to use paint? How what about you, football? How do you use a canvas, et cetera, right? That's education. And that's why education has to be prior before we start experimenting, because otherwise we become children. And the difference here is that children play, but human grown-ups experiment. And if you want to be in a sort of experimental mode, then we first have to learn all these trades on how you do things before we can do it. And that is hierarchy. So the, the, we, the, you can have a flat landscape between equals, so all are educated to a certain level that they can express themselves accordingly. I think Marshall McLuhan would say that football is art, uh, and and so is advertising, and and uh, you know all kinds of. Uh, he says art is is what captures your attention. It's like anything that captures your attention. Yeah, he, he has a very interesting, he has basic, a very broad, broad and it, idea it is, of, of art. But it, uh -huh. it, it, it's not he's not using art in a nice way, right? To him, art is just yeah, it's artifact. It's art, period. And mm -hmm. art, anything you put in a gallery white walls pretends to be something it isn't. Because you already got it everywhere. Because well, anything, he doesn't anything, say quality or, and, or not like quality. No, like, no, he, or, or he's, very judgment, he's very judgmental against art. You have to remember that. He's, he's not saving art by saying that. We Hold might on a minute. No, cause, cause I was anything that catches your eyes or catches your ears is art, period. That's a very basic, great understanding of what art is. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I agree with yeah. him, but that has to be, you have to be reminded that he's, he's not a Nandi War, Warhol it, it kind of guy who celebrates soup cans, you know. Yeah, but he says that art, you know, you, you, the judgment of, of a great piece of advertising or whatever would be like, it, it takes time to judge it. Like what we think of as art, we, we don't know if it's art in the moment because it's totally impossible to know what is art in the moment because, you know, you need you need years of, uh, it has to go through, oh, go yeah. through time but before years it becomes, to, before you years can consider before it you to can, be art. Mm. Years before you can make it, years to understand what it is. That's again, yeah. royal and priestly. Yeah, so exactly. yeah, both. Intelligence Football and is also religion. Football is religion to people. Yes, that's true. That's true. But so, it's a religion because it reflects religion that's deeper. It reflects the hunting team or the warfare team and things like that. Maybe that's we can distinguish here between, because you say always religion is everything, Alexander, and maybe we could distinguish between primary religion and then all the secondary religion or, or something like that. Because if you say religion is everything, then, then, then how do you know what religion is exactly? I mean, what is, you know, when we talk about religions like Christianity or Buddhism or how are they different from football and, and, no, uh, and well, basket weaving? And football is performed, religion is performed, but religion is rarely, if ever, created because it has been created already. That's the point you and I make that we did. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. We went for the old religions, the smaller exclusive religions that actually made an effort and therefore will survive all the other big pop ones, right? So that, that was my point. So yeah, I mean football is religion in the sense that it reflects religion, yeah. But there's also that relationship then there between football uh, as religion and football as art. So I do think there's a way for these things to come together in an important sense, because that was something you, you rejected before. Oh, yeah, there's an interdependence of, you know, of these spheres, right? They inform each other. So I think we're making games. I think the shamans are creating games that then become those games that everyone can play 
that's the real open religion but there's a hierarchy in that some people are better at playing the game than others and everyone loves and appreciates them because they love the game and they're also involved but not everybody plays football. There's spectators. Fuck loads yeah. of people play football. But do you know, <laughs> like, it's, a, it's the world game. That shit's already won. Next podcast, football and philosophy. Yeah, I think world impact, seriously, with football and philosophy gives a continual landscape of metaphor, context, embodied context to situate really deep understanding in just concrete stuff that everyone can, can get. Not everyone, but like, I think there's something, there's something very interesting there. Yeah, there, there's, to the pe there's pedagogics and, and, and mm -hmm. you can do a lot with really great pedagogics is rhetorics as well, right? Mm -hmm. But th there, the point with the Bard Absolute concept, which is where we started, is that some things are so complex that we should not fool ourselves into believing they're widely distributed to anybody who is not educated and can just lazily walk mm -hmm. it through the door and think they can have everything. Because that is to me the current predicament. And yes, I don't want to no. fall into that trap by, by promising people something is available to them that they will not even understand. I think, I think right. what we need right now is sort of a revival for, for the separation on the, and the membranics of saying that you can do this now, you probably, can't do, you probably can do this later, and don't ever go there because it's not your thing. You know? No, it's an important other, point, I, and it's one that you should be making in your position of like holding the wisdom here. And I, I agree with you. I, I, really, I, really, I really do agree with you. Let me presence this, though. It was something Jonathan, I heard Jonathan Pajot say, um, the, the icon carver, someone who's becoming very well known as a sort of resuscitator of Christianity and advocating people return to Orthodox Christianity as the vehicle you know, through which to get through this time. And he sort of differentiates the sort of um, liturgical masters. So like this Thomas Aquinas is and the sort of the intellectual pre priestly elite of Christianity and, and the understandings they have um, from, you know, sort of the common person who really might relate to God as a figure in the sky. And that there's something important about the narrative of Christianity that allows a cohabitation of people that is, it believe propositionally very different things, but are somehow still participating in the same thing together. And what I want to say is that I find I'm quite uneasy about that. I'm quite uneasy about um, such a sharp division in what we end up believing. Yeah. And yet, and so I'm sort of interested to sort of put that, to, to sort of raise that, because what I'm keen on is that there is an integrity, that there's an integrity and a, and a, 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 like a real integrity to the continuity of commitment and dedication in these re-emergent religions that are so it, it's it's that 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 i want to preserve right it's not that hey you're like yes you don't have the capacity to participate in the sort of inner sanctum and we could say a lot about that but i want to treat that so carefully but I also don't want to have a situation where um, that person's saying a whole bunch of shit that really is just not actually what we really mean. Do you know what I mean? I think people, you know, are always that this. I mean, Jonathan's point. I, I've heard him say that that before is that you know that that some people are, have a grade nine education, right? And they need myth, mythological gods and and and. Uh, they, uh, you know, they need a certain kind of polytheism almost, or, or they fit, they can fit within Christianity because Christianity uh, provides them a you know a message that they, they can understand. Um, it sounds like opium for which, the masses. But, but for on me, the other hand, now. when I hear him say that, it, it does sound a little bit condescending to to those types of people uh, on some level. Yes, like, he's okay, building some open truth, and yeah. then all these other people, they're just the common people, and they need this common religion. And no, no, no th th there's a point to what he's saying, but I would yeah. take the Zoroastrian point of view here, which is that ultimately it will not hold because he's trying to build the building with walls and a roof without a proper basement first. You cannot go back now and be ironic and say, yeah, we know this religious bullshit, we're gonna build on it anyway. You can't do that. It's just like, no, forget it. You gotta go back deeper down into history and then start to ask yourself the really serious question is, when did this religion start selling itself cheaply? When did this religion compromise on the quality and went for the quality? Because any large religion, including Orthodox Christianity, has done that somewhere along the line. That is what I call the root of the phallus and go back to that root. That's one project you need to do is to go back to the root of the phallus. And for you and me, 
Andrew, that meant we went back further back. We didn't stop at Orthodox Christianity just because Protestant and Catholic Christianity went off the roof or whatever. We went further back. So in that way, Piazza is right, but he's not, he's not radical enough to his own idea. I think he should go Jewish and, or, or Zoroastrian or <laughs> well, something like what that. I think, what I think, what I've heard is that- yeah, is but that, Can I finish, right? Andrew, Andrew, let me finish first. Let me finish first. But the other aspect the of person. this, the Zoroastrian point of view is that the folk religion is perfectly okay. It's just cruel and mean to take the Elvis Presleys and the Michael Jacksons and the Madonnas and even the Donald Trumps, whatever celebrities people like to worship or the Ganeshas of the world or whatever. In Zoroastrianism, wh why this is the origin of free speech, that's Persia. Why it is the origin of free speech? It's basically because the priest said, we have a very weird, strange, awfully dark religion that we practice called Zurbanism. Then we have another religion for the military called Mithraism, which is just again and again and again, is bullfighting all over again. It's St. George and the Dragon all over again. That's what military guys need to do. And then we got the folk religion, and it's essentially mother and child and tons of saints and idols. Okay? That's three different religions in one. And Zoroastrianism is only the key to unite them, which is basically the celebration of being and mind. That's it. That worked in the Persian Empire for 1400 years. That's why I believe in its resurrection, because I think it actually makes sense today, because the alternative is Hinduism. Those are the only two alternatives we have eventually as we go along. But the, the key here is that you can perfectly well accept that people can worship whatever they like, but to cynically say they should, or say that we should allow that and the rest of us, the elites, should step out of the way to allow for the common folks to do their thing. That's just the kind of sort of middle class bullshit that middle class people do when they, when they discuss it with the working class and they have, you know, the, the class analysis goes completely wrong. I'm totally with the working class in the sense I'm totally with people, allow them to do whatever they like. But for me, for people who seek my advice and go on the journey with me towards wisdom, it's all about to be as radically truthful as I possibly can. And that's why irony to me only makes sense together with affirmation. Irony is how you summarize history, but it's oh, not cool. where you got to go next. Next, you go with affirmative. This is Nietzsche, this is Hegel. You go to the ironic because you don't want to stay in the cynical. So you get out of the cynical understanding of the world that the old model didn't work. You go towards the ironic where you play around with the old model to get to the new, which is dialectics. And then when you find the new, affirm it fiercely, and that's your project. Hmm. Because that, where he's lost me is that he's trying to fake it here. And you can't fake it. You cannot build a skyscraper any longer without a proper basement because digital would just blow it off in seconds these days. That's how hmm. factual the world is going to become. Hmm. Yeah, I mean... Um... So having watched, you know, a little bit of, of Jonathan, like I'm absolutely sure he'd have lots to um, say here and oh, yeah, um, certainly, guy. certainly speak his case. I think one sense I do get from him is that there's an acceptance that there will always be a sort of chaotic character that you have to sort of accommodate. Uh, actually, uh, lots of people might fall into that category. And I'd like to also raise this in relation to so a figure like um, Daniel Schmachtenberger, for instance, seems to me to be very much committed to the importance of basically generating the developmental conditions in society such that everyone can like has, comes to a point of being a, um, a capable steward of the power we've all developed. And when you roll out the arguments as to the increasing power we have in smaller boxes, just metaphorically, then yeah, it's pretty important that people don't go, you know, off the deep end and start using that power in ways that can obliterate us all. So it's, it, you know, it's quite important that we do to have create structures then that enable a real participation in contribution where that isn't some bullshit self is basically what I'm trying to say. I love Daniel, but that's exactly where he contradicts himself. <laughs> he wants everybody to be with us. He wants to be the good boy that everybody comes with us, the masses can follow and we could all be lifted together. Like it's a very Platonist fantasy. But for that to happen, there has to be an architect who designs a certain architecture that makes it possible. And then that architect becomes superior to everybody else. And that's him. 
And what I always tell Jordan Hall that is back to Berger, I love these guys to bits. I should say that. But, I, but, but my position towards them, I discussed it with Jim Roth, who's a shared friend the other week. We recorded the podcast together. I said, the problem is that these guys are too fascinated with urban planning. They're too fascinated with being the little boys who are going to decide and direct how human beings should live to become equals. And, and so I think it's impossible. In, in this sense, I think the, you've got to be radically honest about that you're trying to create some kind of an elite when you do so. In my case, it's simply symbolic elite. I'm working with narratives. It could be imaginary elite. That's when you try to take over politics, for example. And it could be real elite. It means you take over the data and you own and you process the data of the world today, which is big tech in China is trying to do right now. And we're fighting them for it. So yeah. you got to- That would be Jonathan Pajot's critique also, I, I would think that- Of Daniel and- Guys are trying yeah. to do it on their own. They're not, they're not working with an ancient, uh, the, the ancient wisdom. They're trying, they're trying to- um, Create another kind they of do not admit structure. their desire to be leaders mm -hmm. and to lead. And they don't admit their mm -hmm. desire to be architects of this new world, thinking they're superior because they're architects. It, somebody's got to be the architect of any structure before you build the structure. And that architect is automatically top of that hierarchy. That's just the way it works. Yes, it, but the architect only comes to that understanding because like, just to use the cliche, they're standing on the shoulders of giants. And so if we actually develop the capacity to, <laughs> okay, metaphorically die appropriately into a shared appreciation of the beauty of life and the opportunity to live together in the face of this more ir um, inexorable, more, more tidinal, fucking force the void then the then we we can appreciate particular names but the names become less they they fade after a time and we appreciate the new football players of today right eventually people will more or less forget about like pele and maradona right they might remember them in three centuries time but garincha and these other ones they'll be lost to the annals of history and what will be will be the the living presence of now. So I think right in here, this this polemics we have, these polls we have here, there's such a generative conversation to be had here. Um, and I, I think where you're speaking from, Alexander, has so much to add. Um, but I also know where they're coming from does as well. And there's a, yeah, it's very exciting. There's something beautiful in there. Yeah. So my point is that I agree with Dan and Jordan on what they're doing. I just think they should, they should admit that they're creating a hierarchy. And this idea that everybody should come along in their model it does not work. What you do is that you're in Egypt and you offer everybody to belong to the chosen ones. And most people will reject it because they won't believe it's going to happen or they don't want to be part of it. But a minority will. And of the minority, you then have to handpick the people that are fit to walk 40 years through the desert, or at least walk through the desert and give birth to children who can then enter the promised land. Otherwise, they're a waste. Okay? You pick them out, you create an elite, the elite leaves Egypt and walks towards the promised land, you create the new paradigm. That's why I'm writing about exoduses. Okay? So I think Daniel and Jordan are perfect netocrats and synthists. They are everything I've written about in my books with John Sedeckist. They personify those things, and that's why I love these guys. But I think you need to get out of the sort of Platonist mentality of uh, you can magically create the better world by making everybody enlightened at the same time because it's not how it works. This is why we talked about the Bard Absolute. This is why we talked about membranes. We talked about you need to take one step at a time. And some doors are closed forever to you and have a sign that says you will not be allowed in, but maybe your children will. And that ultimately say so from being banal or vulgar or, or infantile about our approach towards the future and towards religion. Hmm. Look, I feel like where I would take this next is another three hour conversation. So <laughs> yeah. I, I'm yeah. feeling like maybe I have ma many things on the tip of my tongue, but yes. <laughs> Go on, yeah. Andrew. Have a last, you have a last one then, Andrew. Mm -hmm. Well, what, what, I, I was you just, you know, it's, it's this tension between people who want to create a world, right? They want to create the new world and, 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 and the people who, who are, uh, I, I don't think the new world can be created like, like in a systematic, a systematic manner, so to speak. Um, but then again, I'm a traditionalist. So, so, so that's what I think these guys are missing. I, and I think I, I agree with Alexander. I think they're absolutely, uh, um, Br br brilliant people but uh yeah, there's no but but and, and uh and, and and worthy of of you know all of the, these creative endeavors but but 
the I, I don't fully believe in the stark uh, picture they're painting of of a sort of dystopia or utopia, and we have to do this and this and this uh, for this and this and this reason to get to the utopia. You know, um, it, it seems to me too simple a, a, a recipe. Yeah, it's so like I, 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 think, I was I in, I was in a meeting. I think I was in a meeting last week. With, yeah, yeah. yeah. I was in a meeting last week with some environmentalists, and we looked yeah. at a plan of a new road being built in Scandinavia. I looked at the road and said, you built this entire fucking road for diesel engines? Yeah, because you're pulling all the air out everywhere along the road and it costs you hundreds of billions of dollars to do that? Yeah, we're not gonna have any diesel engines in 10 years time. And I just realized we can, we can create narratives of the future. We can create utopias and preferably protopias. But at the end of the day, when people sit down, architects are gonna build the future tomorrow. And this is one of the most advanced cultures in the world, one of the wealthiest and most educated. And they can't even figure it out how to build a road for the future. <laughs> they build the road according to old paradigmatics. They build the road according to the old rules. They build, they yeah. build everything they do according to the old world. And that's yeah. why we talk about paradigmatics. In that's why I, I would I'd say that the, the old Jewish rabbi who says it's God's will, uh, you know, somehow that, that makes more <laughs> sense to me, right? Uh, then, then um, oh, we got to do this with this sort of desperation and... and, and hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I hear you on that, but then I just factor many fairly clear and quick arguments to make relating to the exponential power associated with our technological capacity. And then I factor what Alexander speaks about with the, you know, triple layers of power and how they manifest in i've got it here in my notes uh the nexialist the curator and the eternalist and we obviously can't go there this is one way we could have gone into talking about the same sorts of things but it's like jeff bezos is out there and every time i buy a, a shirt man gets a cut and that's just outrageous because he's doing it for everything and like we can paint the dystopian narrative exceptionally well is the sad thing and so it does in some way seem to me there is a fairly stark contrast ahead it has to we have, I have to go the, there I have, with process i have the solution tim you go and convert jeff bezos and he gives you all his money to you <laughs> <laughs> that's what cost well, leaders do <laughs> that's that's definitely a conversation for non-recorded i think <laughs> that's, yeah there you go all right well shall we uh shall we stop it there yeah wonderful love you guys to bits wonderful yeah. conversation Thanks so much yeah beautiful thank you thank so you much guys. yes thank you for listening and if you enjoy these podcasts, please consider sharing them or leaving a review, and perhaps also to consider supporting it on patreon.com voicecraft.